This is Nursing Uncensored. I'm your host, Adrienne Benning, and I invite you to listen in on conversations I've had with real nurses about the crazy and wonderful lives we lead. This podcast is meant to create laughter in addition to serious discussion, and nothing is off limits. We're always honest, but we're not always safe for work. Please listen responsibly. Welcome to Nursing Uncensored. I am your host, Adrienne. For those of you who haven't been here before, I am a pulmonary and palliative care step-down nurse. And so um, I am here today with actually a really great topic for you. Um, I, I think first I'd like to say that I think of all the things that 2020 has taught us, one of the things that it's teaching us is the power of our voice. Not only our individual voices, but our collective voices. And I think for nurses, there's a lot of power and promise in that. So I think that there's a lot that can come of having a collective voice um, for not only the field of nursing, but for healthcare in general. When nurses are involved, I think things are always better. So um, I'm happy to have this discussion today with Dr. Kim Chi Woods. She is the president of Chamberlain University College of Nursing, the uh, Columbus campus, and the CEO of Nursing One, which is going to be the focus of our talk today. Welcome to the show, Judy. Nice to meet you. you. Very (laughs) nice to meet you too. So there's a lot that I'd love to talk about today, but before we get down into the real meat of this discussion, I would love it if you would tell our listeners a little bit more about yourself, your journey through nursing, the roles you hold, anything you want to tell us. We're all yours. Okay, sure, sure. I would love to. Um, I was born and raised and educated in Israel. And uh, when I came to the United States in the 70s, um, I was a a diploma nurse. And uh, uh, when we came to the United States, we came to Columbus, Ohio, for my husband to pursue a degree at Ohio State University. And as the plane took off uh, from Israel to the United States, I said, we're not going back (laughs) until I have a doctorate in nursing, (laughs) which was always my dream. Um, And so I love um, education. So I have a a bachelor uh, degree in nursing from Ohio University. And then I went to the Ohio State University and uh, to get a master's degree, a doctoral degree and a nurse practitioner certification. So I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner uh, with both certification, but my uh, license is inactive. I'm, I'm not working in that. I couldn't do everything. <laughs> everything. You can't do everything. You yes, do so much. You can. And so, then like, later on, I went and I obtained um, an MBA degree from Franklin University to get kind of a, an overall perspective because my perspective was just nursing. Mm-hmm. And I felt that the business degree would help and it has helped um, a lot. Of course. Wonderful. So have you been back to Israel since you oh, Yeah, many doctor? times. Yeah, yeah. I have professional ties as well. I have family, a lot of family members. So I go back and forth and my children go and it's very, uh, very nice. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I enjoy that. But uh, our home is here and mm-hmm. I've been here uh, for over 40 years and mm-hmm. have my children already have their own families and uh, so home, nice. this is home this and is all home. my friends too. Nice. Very, very nice. So let's talk about nursing one. That's the thing we're here to talk about today. So, so what is nursing one? What's the nursing one 101? <laughs> nursing one 101 is a, a grassroots nonprofit organization with the intent to unify all nurses, all 3.5 million, 4 million, whichever the correct number is, all in one unified voice, because I believe there is strength in numbers. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been suffering in nursing is that we don't have one voice and consequently we have no power and no strength. So we cannot, uh, we have been unable to change things in nursing that needed Uh, to change. So when I was a young uh, nurse in my 20s at um, Ohio University, we had to write a paper, which I consequently found last holiday was I was cleaning and I had tears in my eyes to say, wow, 40 years and it hasn't changed just like I thought, but I did not see that I put it in writing. So um, 
Uh, back then, I thought, well, we need to get organized. And then my second thought was, well, my elders, our elders will do this. And then 40 years pass and I'm the elder. And I just thought that if I don't take personal responsibility to do it, um, then who will? So I've just taken it upon myself to try to do this. It's, um, uh, it's an organization that we would like to champion causes that are important to nurses and nursing. And it is very different from other organizations because usually it's about patients. Anytime you talk to nurses about what can we do for patients, which is great, but we lack compassion for ourselves and we forget ourselves and taking care of things that are important to us so that we could enjoy working as nurses for many, many years and not have it cut uh, short by many things that, that uh, can happen. So that's what Nursing One is. And it's open, uh, Adrian, it's open to everyone. It's for registered nurses and LPNs and uh, LPN students and RN students, um, retired nurses people that love nursing and want to support Nursing One and organizations. So basically anyone can belong to Nursing One and we do need everybody. Mm -hmm. I got chills a couple times because first of all, thinking about how nurses were, we are known as this like selfless occupation. We are always focused on improving patient outcomes. What can we do to make our, our role at the bedside better? But you're right. As a nurse, I can tell you, I'll be the first to tell you, I take way better care of my patients than I do of myself. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that is not the way to have a long productive career as a nurse or as a person like that mm -hmm. wears you out. I think it's very interesting that you also said, I have taken it upon myself to work on this. And that's what we need to do. Mm -hmm. On your website, there is a Florence Nightingale quote. And I don't, I wish I would have copied it so that I, I have it. Please, please read yeah. this quote. This is it's, so important. The quote says, Will the none who were discontented with what they have, the world would never reach anything better. As advocates for our patients, we're always thinking, okay, my next quality improvement project or my next evidence-based practice project is going to be something that bothers me at work, something that doesn't work, something mm -hmm. I want to fix. But never do I hear nurses talking about those things that, that never get fixed, that we never pay attention to. And so it is important that we collectively take responsibility. We collectively take individual responsibility. Yeah. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Also on the website, you talk about how this is similar to like the AARP in a sense that it, it's a, a unified organization for all people over 50, right. but those people have different demographics in every direction. Right, right. Absolutely. And I used, uh, I studied the organization a lot and uh, read uh, the writings of the founder and um and I thought it was the best model because for $12 a year, you and a, and a husband or a partner could be um, a member. And I always thought that, well, I actually know that about 80% of nurses don't belong to any nursing organization and it's because it's expensive. And so this is why it, the membership in Nursing One, it's set at $10 a year. So, but my thought is that if we have 2 million people, that's a whole lot of, with $10, that's a whole lot of money that we can do a lot of things with. So we don't really need, um, it doesn't need to be that expensive, but um, generating the interest in nurses joining, mm -hmm. it's uh, difficult. So what we have, done in the beginning when we just launched, um, I offered free membership to uh, nurses in Ohio who graduated um, 18 months before we launched and it was free and I just sent them um, membership uh, cards and um, and similar to when you turn 50, you get a card in the mail that says that hey, you're, you know, free member, free membership for you. And um, so, and then low cost conferences, and we just had our first conference in a 
for seven contact hours, it was $50. Um, so I think it's very affordable. So $10, a price of maybe two cups of coffee. Mm -hmm. So for one year, I think that is, um, that is doable. Um, and then they spend, uh, ALP spends a lot of money on um, lobbying, the lobbying arm, and partnering with many other organizations. And Nursing One is not in competition with any organization. We will work with any nursing organization, but we must achieve what hasn't, has not been achieved yet. So there are so many, um, uh, so many accomplishments in nursing, such as we get paid much better than I used to. I, I think I made $5.32 an hour, <laughs> an hour years ago. Oh, wow. So uh, we have certainly uh, paid well for our work, uh, which is wonderful. And then I have students who start a Chamberlain that say, I want to be a nurse practitioner. So they already, so being a nurse practitioner is really um, something that they already know about and they plan. So we certainly have elevated the level of nursing that we do. And uh, technology has evolved and we certainly um, have improved that. But then we get to the point that when I do talk to our graduates, they always work short staffed. Well, that's a story of 40 years. Mm -hmm. Why can't it be fixed? And I actually have idea <laughs> ideas for that, <laughs> how it can be fixed. But if you have nurses that are happy in the workplace, there is no revolving door. And then you don't have to spend so much money to reorient new nurses. And there is a consequence to patients where you have a lot of working nurses all in the same place. Quality of care is not as good as when you have experienced nurses, especially July 1st, as we know, right? Oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> the famous July 1st. For those who don't work in healthcare, July 1st is when we have all of our new medical residents come out into the hospital and they are very new, very well intentioned, but sometimes as a nurse, you need to be paying attention to the orders coming through because some of those orders might be written not the way they should be. And we are the first line of defense against errors and things like that. So we need to catch these things. So July 1st puts a little bit of, of dread into experienced nurses. But I think that that's the time where, again, we use our collective strength. And as nurses, we're all kind of heightened, you know, paying attention, helping our new residents learn the, learn the field, so to speak. Um, so I think that's yet another example where as nurses, we collectively have to like huddle up and be like, okay, it's almost the first, we need to be on our toes about this. Yeah. Um, but what, do, what, do, what kinds of things do we gain by having all of, actually, I want to, before I ask that question, before I give that to you, I just want to point out, remember when, uh, I don't know, you, you must have heard about this, Joy Behar, one of the hosts of The View, made some comment about, well, why is a nurse wearing a doctor's stethoscope? Mm -hmm. And the outrage from the nursing profession, yeah. social media lit up, everybody had an opinion. And so when I first um, got your email about Nursing One, I thought, now if only we could get that kind of collective action mm -hmm. and voice mm -hmm. behind things like short staffing, yeah. which right now is so terrible where I'm working. So, so I mean, I show me your stethoscope. There was, I belong to that uh, Facebook same, uh, same. Mm -hmm. yeah, community and uh, uh, nurses playing with cards and all, you know, mm -hmm. it's nice oh, yeah. except that as a professional nursing organization, I feel uncomfortable being controversial. I would like to be leading and would like to be innovative, uh, but uh, not really con controversial sure, sure. Uh, because that just creates tension. And I mm -hmm. always believe you get more with honey than vinegar. So uh -huh. I like that. I like to collaborate and work. And when we talk about collaboration, I have this dream that I will find this one CEO of the hospital that will be willing to look at uh, Nurses' Bill of Rights 
do you know that we have Bent Nurses Bill of Rights? Most nurses don't really know. And so when I looked it up, I remember that I taught students about that. So ANA, American Nurse Association, has have Nurses Bill of Rights. But when you look at it, it's only registered Nurses Bill of Rights. Well, what happened to LPNs? So I, we are very inclusive and everybody that takes care of patients, so whether you're an LPN, an ADN, also APRN, uh, everybody ha should have the same rights. But as I looked at the rights, I've actually revised them. I'm trying to write an article about that because the rights are very patient focused. Not all of it, but most of it. Mm -hmm. So I added few that talk about the rights of the nurses. But what I've learned also, um, Nurses Bill of Rights has no teeth. Mm -hmm. Nobody has to do anything about that. It's just kind of there. It's not posted anywhere like Patient Bill of Rights. And so uh, as I trace back how the Patient Bill of Rights came to be, well, it was political. And this is why hospital opted then instead of being told what to do to go ahead and do the Patient Bill of Rights. So we need that to be that. So I want that one CEO that will say, let's do, um, let's implement these, these, the Bill of Rights for nurses and actually do this, not a lip service like shared governance where you get to say what you want to say, but you don't really get to make decisions. Mm -hmm. But looking, sitting with individuals that run the hospital, understanding that a hospital, or any healthcare facility is a business and must run in a certain way. But could we have a middle of the road where you don't run the hospital showed staffed all the time because that's how you lose nurses. Mm -hmm. And uh, then uh, the conference, for example, for Nursing One that we just had was violence against nurses. That is a very prevalent issue. I, I have a, a, a binder that is this thick of article and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. So that uh, it's underreported, boards of nursing don't ask nurses, have you been violated or you know assaulted in your, in your workplace by a family member or a patient, uh, I don't, it's not handled uh, consist, in a consistent manner in all of the, the hospitals and the work, uh, health um, <laughs> and organizations. Uh, yeah, I tried to say healthcare, I just got healthcare facility. <laughs> so so we, we should, we should. So when, and I'm gonna jump now to, to the PPEs, for example. So I'm sure you've noticed that the nurses who are on the screen on national news and local news are those nurses that are either crying that was in the beginning of the pandemic and telling us how horrible it is and the patients are dying alone and we don't have PPEs. But then we had on the West Coast a group of nurses that refused to take care of patients without proper PPEs and they either got fired or they left or something like this. They got a hot 30 second one time on the national news and I've not seen it since. Mm -hmm. But the nurse, so the vision of the nurse as being soft, caring, this is the vision uh, that the media embraces and this is what the public sees. We need the public to see the intelligent, uh, the nurse that has skills, that uh, decision-making, delegation, authority. Um, we, if we, if nurses were tasked with running the, the response to pandemic, that would have been really done very well, but we are not. So I don't see any nursing leaders. Where are all of our nurse epidemiologists? I know we have some but we don't see them. And bless their heart, I mean, the doctors are doing a wonderful job uh, during the pandemic, but we don't see nursing leadership. So again, if we were large, uh, we would, I mean, as the pandemic started, I was like, oh, we are so little, we can't really do anything or have an impact. But if we are large and we have a million nurses, we can have a voice and to try to push um, legislation too through for example when my husband and I took a cruise before we started the cruise everyone received a life vest and you have to stand there and go through a drill there was a life vest for every passenger on this huge cruise ship so 
hospitals should be mandated to have PPEs at least one set for every, every healthcare professional who would need it in the hospital. And if they expire, well, so be it. That's like an insurance, you know, you pay a lot in insurance and you hope that you don't really get to use it. Is it a waste of money? Well, it really depends how you look at it, but you protect your people. You can't run hospitals mm -hmm. without nurses. You can't run any healthcare facility without nurses. So we have the power, except it's not realized because other people keep telling us what to do and what will happen. And that takes me to legislation. There are legisla legislations that are made about nurses without one nurse sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. We need to change that. Absolutely. It's kind of a norm that nurses aren't consulted. Like for example, yeah. I've known hospitals that have bought new hospital beds and they spend incredible amounts of money on these hospital beds. But then when the nurses start to use them, the nurses realize that there are things about them that really just aren't conducive to the type of mm -hmm. care we need to provide. Hi. And so we all say things like, now, if only they had asked us, if Why? only they had made us part of the decision. Yeah. And I think that while that's a small example, I think that we can extrapolate that to the legislative level. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I know that my school, I went through an ADN program initially before doing an RN to BSN program, and we actually did do um, like a nurses legislation day, day of action, and they got groups together from all the nursing schools, and they went out to our state capitol to kind of be a part and be a witness of that process. When we had students going to these legislative action days, I noticed that the groups were really small. And I always thought to myself, what a difference it would be if we could get our entire graduating, our entire cohort together to show up. What a, what a, what a show of force that would be. Yeah. And it, it's funny that, as you said, the media and society loves this image of like the the doting, compassionate yes. nurse. Right. But I've seen some nurses that are so viciously, I shouldn't say vicious, they are so intensely protective of their patients mm -hmm. that if you come in and start messing with an ICU nurse's drip, yeah, like you're going to, <laughs> yeah, there's, there's yes. not a side of that nurse that is soft and sweet. So we yes. are very, I think we are very much guardians of our patients and we need to yeah. have that same fervor and that same intense protectiveness of ourselves and if not ourselves then each other you know yeah well it I, don't you think it has to do with respect we have to Absolutely. respect ourselves of what we do and I think we also don't have enough self-compassion and it's a good exercise there is a, a scale of self-compassion online somewhere that I use and I was really I think that it's from one to five I think I was like in the low two and I really had to work on um, self-compassion, taking care for some of the things that I need um, so that, that kind of recharge yourself so you can continue to take care of other people. Mm -hmm. But it also has to do with how you grew up. I grew up in a household where mo mom always put herself last. So that's mm -hmm. how I do it. did it with my family and I suppose still do. Uh, but we kind of have to learn this skill, and especially in the workplace, at the end of the day, it's a job. I mean, it's, uh, it's many of us feel um, altruistic. Uh, this is our mission in life, which I agree. I like that. I think nursing is, is kind of me. I love nursing, and, um, and I do it like on work, but also my private time, I like to read about nursing. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just us, but we still have to separate it and think about the things, the environments where we work, we need a better environment, not eating, uh, nurses eating their young, which, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if it exists in other professions, but it exists in nursing, it does, yeah. um, not having, uh, being protected, feeling safe. Um, during the conference, we had um, a group of nurses that work with uh, brain trauma patients and uh and so sometimes they would know that a patient is combative and is coming from the emergency room to the floor well how about if hospitals have a security assessment like if a patient is a security risk then you put a, a police officer or a security officer 
on the floor to help the nurses. It's not up to the nurses. Uh, it's not part of your job to handle a patient who is so combative. It's, it's part of your job to take care of the patient, but there are other people more equipped to take care of someone who is physically combative so you don't get hurt. And there are plenty of stories of nurses that their livelihood was taken. They can't work mm -hmm. because they were injured by a patient or a family member. Unacceptable, just Absolutely. unacceptable. But somehow we accept it. And, there is, and I asked the nurse, the panel that we had, so do the nurses report every attack or every assault? No, they don't. Well, why not? So it needs to be in college. I, was, I worked at the Nationwide Children's Hospital and uh, the, uh, kind of my last job before I took the position at uh, Chamberlain University College of Nursing and I worked in um, quality improvement. And it was a difficult task to teach the nurses about near miss incidents and, and show why you need to report it. So if you don't report it, we didn't know it you know, that it existed. And if you don't report it, we can put system in place to prevent that from then happening again, maybe then getting to a patient. So the same thing with violence. If we don't report it, then the people above us don't really know it's a big issue. Right. Um, and then are not really encouraged uh, or informed enough to take action to make sure that we put some systems, systems in place to protect us. So I think that's really very, I think that's really very important. And these are, you know, just staffing violence is really two very important issues. And then if we have wonderful workplaces to work in and wonderful work environments, the nurses are not going to leave. I mean, there are nurses at Nationwide Children's Hospital here in Columbus that I started there as a staff nurse and they're still working at the hospital. That, that's the, the longevity. There are so many people with 20, my husband retired from there. He's a respiratory therapist and he was there almost 30 years. And, that, and it's, he's not uh, unique. There's so many people because it's a really nice place to work. Mm -hmm. and, and that's uh, the sign of a good work. unit. Yeah. And they take really good care of you. And so you want to stay. Right. Yeah. I think that that's, that's the key is that when, when we have, so we have, you know, these violent acts occurring, which I've been assaulted multiple times as a nurse and the attitude becomes, so, so it is this vicious cycle because then you don't report it. Leadership doesn't realize it's a problem. And then the nurses feel like, well, leadership's not doing anything about it. So they must not care. So why do I bother to report right. it? Right. And so it becomes this self-perpetuating cycle mm -hmm. and we need to like break that cycle. And we need to do it by saying that we're, we're not going to tolerate it anymore. And then yeah. it's true. Those nurses that do take that stand and say, I'm not going to work in this environment because it's dangerous to me. And then we're seen as, as not being altruistic or mm -hmm. like we're defying some expectation of the yeah. job. Like you should just accept the fact that you're going right. to get assaulted while you're trying to take care of someone. Right. And so, see, we need to make it, I'm sorry. No, the, that's okay. We need to make it as a a joint commission priority mm -hmm. because what happens is when it's a joint commission priority then hospitals and other organizations uh, are required to take mm -hmm. um, action on that so but, but that takes a whole lot of data and uh -huh. a lot of people pushing it to say this is really important and uh, we we really need um need, need to do that so this is again if we were organized and there were many of us, if you have a million nurses standing behind you and says, we would like this and here's the data, we will also have money to, to do uh, more targeted uh, research studies or even just quality improvement studies into uh, what is going on and how can we, we change it. I'm actually doing a research study with two colleagues uh, from Chamberlain and uh, we are looking um, at nurses as patients. And it was my uh, uh, personal experience several years ago, I was in the emergency room and my heart rate was doing something really crazy in the middle of the night and it was going like 40, 140, 40, 140. And when it was 40, really you feel like you're gonna die. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, was, it went like this for several hours. And uh, later on I was uh, diagnosed with um, paroxysmal a AFib, but not even one person said to me, uh, don't worry, 
if it doesn't, you know, if the medications don't take care of it, maybe it will cardiovascular to you. Like there are many other things that we could do, but I felt like if it doesn't go back to normal with this, you know, whatever I have in my IV, uh, I'm really going to die. That was really my feeling. So after this, it was a very traumatic uh, time for me because up yeah. to that point, I was 100% healthy and mm -hmm. <laughs> never had anything. And so, um, so this whole uh, experience in the emergency room and then on the floor and the nurses on the floor were great. Uh, it, just, it started me thinking about, so what happens? I mean, are we different patients than, than um, a lay person that goes to, to the emergency room and has the same experience? And my answer is, I think so, mm -hmm. because we know more, so we worry more. So, so it would be really good if there would be a question, just like they ask you about suicidal ideation and you know uh, abuse at home and things like this as part of the assessment, should we ask a person, are they a health professional? Um, and that, or, you know, are you a nurse or a doctor or, you know, whichever way they, they term it, because it makes a big difference. So we did a qualitative study uh, of uh, 22 individuals that are very mixed, everyone um, admitted through the emergency room, male, female, young, younger, older, things like that, different diagnoses. And uh, um, it's very interesting. Some don't want to say who they are, that they know so that they could watch to see what's being done. But then on the other hand, if they know who you are, then they don't give you as much information expected for, yourself, for you to take care of yourself. So there is just, but the reason I wanted to do this study and we are done with the interviews and actually I'm in the, anal in, in the analysis right now and we're gonna write it up. But the thing is, I'd like to bring that to the forefront. So as I was doing a literature review, there is one or two anecdotal um, uh, just uh, points somewhere, maybe opinions or something like this. There are no studies on this topic at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, didn't believe me. They said there, there was just no way. And he did a, a lit search. There aren't any, unless from the time that I started working on it until now, somebody uh, published a study about that. But yeah, we, we're not studying the things that matter to us. Mm -hmm. It's okay to study everything about patients, of course, of course, but let's also study about ourselves. How can we help ourselves? It's very, I mean, some of the stories of people, they had a, a trauma from that. I, I, that was really very traumatic experience. Absolutely. And maybe it could have been lessened if as somebody took the time to realize or to ask and then realize that I was, <laughs> I was so scared. <laughs> so that would have really helped it and not be, not, not make it as traumatic as it was. I've had that experience personally, and I know other people that I work with have had that experience where they receive medical care. And the last time I was injured, I know nothing about orthopedics, but I felt as though they made this assumption because I said, you know, oh, I'm a nurse, da, da, da. You know, it wasn't a work-related injury. Um, and then I think they expected this level of knowledge, knowledge base knowledge. Yeah. And I left that appointment thinking, what do I do? I, I'm a lung nurse. Like, I don't know anything about orthopedics. I mean, I know a little bit from nursing school, but there was this assumption and I felt like maybe I wasn't cared for the same way I would have been cared for mm -hmm. if they thought I had no liter healthcare literacy whatsoever. Wow. And I know that other nurses have this experience because I get messages all the time from listeners that say, oh, this thing you guys talked about, I thought that was just at my hospital. I thought we have these collective experiences mm -hmm. that we don't know are collective because we're either not communicating or like you said, this research is not being done. Mm -hmm. Even though there are these, these very clear patterns, negative patterns that we do need to work to change. Yeah. So how do we empower nurses to to be a part of this collective voice? How do we get past those worries of like, oh, well, we've tried this before and nothing works? Yeah. How do we, how do we empower and so rally if the troops? We have, yeah. So if we have a large enough forum mm -hmm. so that we have the, fun, the funds to do it, mm -hmm. but on a small scale right now, I think information is very powerful. So providing information um, to nurses, um, providing tools, tools, kind of a toolkit. So for example, 
how to ask for a raise at your work of appointment. What do you do if you get uh, a negative evaluation and you feel that this is unfair? Mm -hmm. uh, who do you talk to? What, what do you do? Um, uh, let's say you were attacked by uh, a patient or a family member. Um, uh, are you allowed to hit the patient back? And what will happen if you do? Uh, are you allowed to hit the, the family member back? And so we had an attorney um, at the conference who, who talked about it. And it's very, very uh, complex. It, there was no kind of a straight answer um, to that. And so there should be. Now, um, I was really surprised when I was in New York City one year, I saw in the, in the yellow cab a, a little plaque that says, you can sit in jail, something like this, I'm paraphrasing, for 20 years for assaulting a cab driver. Do you know how many years you sit in a jail if you assault a nurse? Uh, in Ohio, zero. None. <laughs> and so um, I think I read that Texas recently made that uh, felony, so I suppose you could uh, sit in jail. But the example from Ohio, there was a bill, uh, and uh, as the bill went through, it just got diluted. And so it, it, it by no means looks what it, it looked like uh, before and, and the intent. So I, these are things that so that you kind of, you know, need to know. Uh, what, if, what if you have issues with uh, your board of nursing? Who do you go to? It's a scary, scary thing that that might happen that you don't really know. And you don't even know to which attorney to go. Um, um, how to bring about changes on your unit, how to bring about changes in your hospital, um, how to make administration listen to you. How, I mean, I, it's just endless. The list, list. goes on. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, how, do you, how do you advocate for your needs, for example? And then also sometimes, how do you advocate for needs of the patients? The patients might have uh, certain needs that are not being met in some healthcare facility. So how do you advocate for that? Uh, in a in a nice way, but st still, you know, do you come up with suggestions? Do you write a document? Do you get, mm -hmm. you know, what do, do you talk to family members? Get them organized. What you know, some things will get you fired, right? Mm -hmm. And so, I kind of need to look at that. Uh, one of the needs that I know, I mean, there is this expectation that you a patient coded and you just the the patient was not uh, it, it, the resuscitation was not successful and you just finish slapping the person who, right, who's going to the morgue, and then you're supposed to be very cheerful to the next person with then, you know, turn on a dime and just do it in 10 minutes and just get with it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think there needs to be much more attention to some of the mental health needs and emotional needs of, of the nurses. And every time, if you work in a in a unit that it's a long-term patients like uh, cystic fibrosis patients, for example, you take care of them repeatedly because they come in for uh, repeated treatment and you lose a patient or if you work in a clinic and you've known them for years and they pass away, that is not something you just get over, mm -hmm. uh, over it uh, and just kind of continue. And so I think there should be forums and understanding, and it's not just nurses, it's, it's uh, um, uh, physicians too, and, and again, other healthcare professionals, but this slow movement of realizing that we need emotional help in dealing with, and some more than others, you know, it, it just kind of depends personally on, on how you deal with issues, but still, we're just uh, people, and we have vulnerabilities. And I've talked about that very extensively on the show. I did an episode about exactly what you're talking about. I work with the cystic fibrosis patients. Oh, you do? And so, yeah. And so we see them and I, and I love my CFers, but yes. the problem is, is that we also do end of life care on my unit. And yeah. so I have the very, and I'm, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm still, I'm feeling the emotions well up, so I'm not going to go too deep into this conversation, yeah. but it's true. We see, we get to know patients we try to keep those professional boundaries, but how do you do that when you take care of someone from the time they're 19 to right. the time they're 35 and in their mm -hmm. last days of life? Like yeah. these are things that a lot of people that don't don't know nurses, don't live with nurses, they have no idea that, yeah, I have the experience 
on a regular basis Mm -hmm. where I'm doing end of life care with a mourning family. And then I go into the next room and I have to cheer on that patient to get out of bed and walk because you need your new lungs to work. Like there's this, it almost makes you feel like you're kind of losing your mind a little bit because (laughs) you have to flip these switches and then you go home and your family asks you how you are. And you're like, how do I even answer this? How do I even, (laughs) where do I even begin? I think, I think all nurses have had that experience, whether with intense end of life stuff or not, even just a hard shift, you know, even just that day that you're like, man, that mm-hmm. was that was really difficult for me. So yeah. I and, think and people take for granted that we just are good at that stuff. Yeah. Well, what about, you know, we also manage the care of the patient. I mean, mm-hmm. we do so much in one yeah. shift. Oh, yeah. Right? And so if you have maybe an incident with um, uh, maybe a physician, uh you know, um, some disagreement or some something, well, that kind of, right, that, that kind of... Um, puts a damper on, on your day and you go home and you might be so kind of mad about, about it, right? And it could be any, any workplace, but that is really compounded by everything else that happened that day. So maybe somebody died and, you know, somebody was just uh, diagnosed. I, I used to work in a, a pediatric surgical unit. And so Sometimes these young people would be diagnosed with cancer and have to go to the oncology unit and things like this. And your half of your heart is just going on <laughs> with the patient moving right to a, another floor with just having a, a such not such a good diagnosis, things like that. So yeah, there was a lot. If you live with with a person who is a healthcare professional, they have a better understanding uh, than if you don't, <laughs> and mm-hmm. that's that makes it even um, more difficult to sure. just um, understand. That's why we need nurses to be supportive of other nurses and then have a forum where we can, uh, we can talk about it and we can vent and we can support each other. And that's, I think this is really very um, important. And I and, think there are a lot of passionate nurses out there that want to be yeah, involved oh, in these things. Definitely. So that's why I think it's so important that you're here talking to all of us because Nursing One is trying to achieve that. And so will you talk a little bit about how people can get involved directly with Nursing One, how they can find you? They can, sure. They go to www.nursingone.org, not .com, that's in Australia. So Mm -hmm. .org. And uh, it's all in the website. Uh, We are, uh, it's a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Uh, They can join as members and then they get a letter, say your member and a a little card attached to that. Um, They could donate to help us. Um, And then there are, so there's a blog uh, there. So I started a feature, it's called Everyday Nurses. There was the story about a coal miner who became a registered nurse. I thought it was good. So I interviewed him and wrote his story. Um, uh, we tried to put some legislative uh, information. Then we were working on the conference, uh, and that took um, a long, you know, a long time. Um, w- there are some perks. There are um, uh, uniforms or scrubs that you could buy for a reduced price. Uh, we have a credit union that is a partner, and you get twenty five dollars free. Uh, in your, if you open a checking account and they'll graciously give nursing one twenty five dollars for each person that joins. So that mm-hmm. is very nice. And we also have Elite, uh, which is a continuing education um, company and uh, you get discounts and they have partnered with us as well. So I'm working on, so for example, I, I think that nurses need financial education uh, mm-hmm. You know, new nurses come in and that's your orientation. They give you this packet of papers and you fill it about your 401k or not. You know, you don't have as much time to really res- uh, write it or even think about what it is that you want to do. And maybe when you're in your 20, not as important, but you may as well uh, learn that um, if they if they match it, then you should you you should have a deduction to the max that they match, right? Because that's free money. But maybe a lot of young people don't know that. So uh, I'm working with Tel Ohio to do some uh, financial education uh, for nurses. Um, 
I would live, love to do so much more, but since uh, I'm running a campus, this is a very busy job. <laughs> uh, so I have an executive council and uh, that executive council are all nurses who are just as busy as I am. So I would say that if I didn't have another you know, my day job, so to speak. I would just be on it and doing a lot of things, but uh, it's just kind of not possible. So be patient with us because it takes a long time to organize a conference. And just on the same day that, that we finish that conference, we're already thinking about our next one. And our next one's going to be probably January or February of next year. And it's going to be, and I learned that there are barriers for women of color to advance in nursing, mm -hmm. which I really was not aware. And so then we started thinking, well, maybe we will also look at nurses who are LGBTQ to see plus to see what are some of the issues that they have in the workplace because I'm not really familiar with with that. And so I think we so it will probably be a conference about uh, diversity and inclusion in nursing. And so we are planning. I already have a few people for the panel. I mean, we're already planning. We just mm -hmm. finished last Wednesday the conference. We're all already planning. So uh, really, I hope that um, a lot of people um, join us. And I really also hope that that your listeners will take um, uh, will take the idea of nursing one and just understand that you can have an idea and you could put it together and you can uh, don't be discouraged because it's difficult. And I want to share with you. Um, in 2012, I was in Washington, D.C. and visited the portrait gallery, and I was so surprised there was one portrait of a nurse. There was not just one. They have 20,000 pieces of art there, and I did not see, of course, all of them, but I only saw one of a nurse. And I turned to my husband and I said, you know why? We, we, we have become invisible to the public. If you are at the hospital, you want a nurse at your bedside. But other than that, there is nobody is talking about nursing. There's no museum for nursing. There was no emphasis on nursing. Little girls don't say, I want to be a nurse. My students that come to us say, uh, it, it's usually experiences later in life that that's a family member, uh, a friend, something happened to them. But I don't hear stories to, that say, oh, I wanted to be a nurse since I was five years old. Well, it's because we don't have enough books about nurses. We have books about wizards and we and anything you, you can think of, but not about nurses. So I said, well, I want to change that. So I came home and I could not stop thinking about it. So I decided to try to organize a nursing exhibit about nurses and nursing, not nursing artifacts like, you know, bedpans and syringes, and th but art. Mm -hmm. So I uh, called the Columbus Museum of Art. And I could not get an appointment. And so I kept calling and emailing and Finally, they told me that if I could have a support of the nursing community, having another conference at the same time and $500,000, then we could talk. So I had the support of the nursing community. I was the president of the Ohio Council of uh, Deans and Directors. And so they were, many of them were supportive. And uh, there was going to be another conference, Ohio State University uh, Dean uh, Ron Melnick was supporting me on that. And I did not have $500,000. So, <laughs> so, but they did give me an appointment. And I, uh, I, may, I wrote this proposal, including, um, um, including on the front, the picture that I want to, to signify that exhibit. And in half an hour of talking to them and sharing my proposal, the museum said yes. And they told me later on that not in a million years did they ever think that they would say yes. And it took three years and a lot of work and, um, and it became, so it came to fruition. So from idea to fruition from 2012 to 2015, March, uh, that's how long it took uh, to raise all the funds. And, um, and it was open for 10 weeks and 38,000 people were in it, uh, that came to see it. And I have the notes from so many nurses saying, I mean, there were nurses in tears during the gala, the opening gala saying how important it was for them that the public sees 
sees us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they said, well, is that going to be a traveling exhibit? Well, I learned a lot about the out, out world doing that. And yeah, that was not possible. Not for me, but for Jeff Bezos, that would be possible to do this, to make it, you know, to, to make it uh, a traveling exhibit. And uh, that was just seriously, just absolutely wonderful. So that, that was one mission that I had, and I felt that uh, I liked art, because I don't know much about art, but I learned, uh, but art is safe, and you don't need a language, and you, it doesn't matter how old you are, and it can move you in many different ways. So that's why I wanted to do it as art. And so now nursing one, and then, um, you know, since I am at some point I will retire or something, then, you know, we need a lot of young people to mm -hmm. kind of take it and, uh, and go with it. I think that it's really important that we recognize that some things do take a little time. Mm -hmm. Um, when I started this podcast, Early on, I felt like I wasn't making any headway. Nobody was listening. It didn't matter. Maybe I should just quit. Nobody's going to notice if I quit anyway. And now, you know, almost half a million downloads later, I'm thinking, okay, I'm glad I didn't quit. And I think that message needs to come through for our listeners that yes. even, you know, I've had other um, nurses that have started nonprofits on this before, and they're very much, they're new, they're growing. They don't, they may not have the impressive numbers that other mm -hmm. organizations do, but I think it's important to get involved at the mm -hmm. ground level yes. because then you are part of that growth. You are part of how that organization mm -hmm. grows. You have a say. And I think that that's what I want people to take away from this, that this is the beginning. You don't have you know, endless hours a day to work on this, yeah. but that doesn't mean that there's not something here to be yes. a part of. And so I do wanna encourage people to check it out and get involved and, also, you know, that, that kind of motivates me to talk a little bit more about the legislative side of things, which I don't know much about, mm -hmm. but I would love to talk to you again in the future, especially about the diversity and inclusion um, mm -hmm. conferences, plans for that education, because I think it is so important that we make sure that all nurses, regardless of their intersections, have the same opportunities, protections, and, you know, like, I, I think that there's a limitless opportunity for all of us. We don't need to be chopping each other down because of our differences. No. Yeah, we it's need just to not build each other up. Yeah, absolutely. And I've given a talk to the, at the Ohio Nurses Association, um, summit uh, one year and that talked about the nursing exhibit but it it looked at the steps that i took to make to make it from idea to fruition so that is if that is something that uh people might be interested we can certainly go go through that because i i had it's like ups and downs like you go like oh that's never gonna happen you kind of get down a little bit it's it's difficult or i talk to so many people who told me I was just absolutely out of my mind to do to try to do this. And I thought, okay, well, uh, I'll talk to the next person and next person. But the other thing is I talk, talk to so many affluent people who could have supported the organization, uh, the exhibit, but they just said it was a good idea, but they didn't really give me any money. Mm -hmm. And so I kept thinking like, what is the tipping point? Like, what is it going to be that will tip it so people will know about it and want to support it? And I figured the only one that care about nurses are nurses. So I just started going to nurses and, uh, and the Ohio Nurses Association donated a lot of money and Chamberlain University donated a lot of money and uh, private pe people, but mostly nurses. Mm -hmm. And then the one day I called another nursing organization and the person on the other side goes, Hey, Judy, we heard about this nurse, uh, this nursing exhibit and we want to contribute. That was the tipping point. I then realized that then it kind of takes a, a kind of a life of its own because then the nurses started calling the museum to say, we would like to hold our annual meeting at the museum. And as part of it, having nurses look at the at the exhibit. And it was a huge success. We we received a lot of free publicity. Um, we were at magazines. Um, uh, I had interviews. I was 
on television too. I mean, there was just a lot of things and it, it kind of happened, but it, it is a lot of work, but I believe it's worth it because it's for nursing and it's for nurses and it's for our future nurses. We, we, I always feel like we need to leave this earth much better than we found it. Yes. I found it well because I've had a lot of wonderful mentors for which I am very thankful but we need to do this and come up with things that will change the face of nursing for the better. And I think that's possible. We have the power and the numbers to do it. We just yeah. need to keep incrementally. I, yes. I believe in the, the power of water. You just need to keep going and you will erode yes. that path that you need. So I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I know you have a very busy schedule and I love that you've been here to give this message to all of our listeners. So I will include links for everything we've talked about in the description. I want to encourage people to check out Nursing One and to uh, keep that spirit of like, we just need to keep we need to keep doing this we need to keep yes. going things will yes. get better look at nursing now versus when you were making five how much was it five five dollars and 32 cents an hour yes yeah that was a lot of years ago but that was but low still, but to, still compared to other nurses yes we keep pushing we keep pushing and yes. things will get better so thank yes. you so much thank i want to so also much. encourage people to check out nursingoncensored.com you can find the blog post the links all of the things that we talk about so um thanks again dr judith Keyfords, for thank you so over. much and i've really enjoyed this conversation and i hope to talk to you again in the future thank you thanks bye bye, have a great bye. Day. and happy nursing i almost forgot that's how I end every show. Happy nursing. Happy nursing. Yes. Bye. Bye.